Hi everybody, it's Marlene with Erie News and today is May 19th, 2022, Thursday, May 19th, 2022. And let's look what's on the on the scheduled for today. And this the first the first article is of course um one of my one of my favorite subjects which is cold cases, murder mysteries and this is uh, appearing in Erie News titled, After 20 years, these cases remain unsolved and a predator uncaught. The summer of 2007 was a busy one for the discovery of human remains in Alabama. On July 22, 2007, partial skeletal remains were found wrapped in a 6 by 8 foot green tarp tied with 72 feet of rope. The remains were buried on private property about 40 feet from the Coosa River on Gladys Road, Titus, Alabama. They were discovered when the property owners were gardening. They seldom visited the location since 1991. Lines seem to have been used around the burial site to stifle the smell of putrefaction. Her estimated date of death ranged from 1950 to 2007. She was probably 30 to 40 years of age and was black or biracial. She was 5 feet tall and had long dark brown hair. Fingerprints are not available, but dental and DNA evidence is available. There was no clothing, jewelry, or other personal items available to identify her. Two months later, on September 29, 2007, a skull and upper jaw bone were found on the roadside at 683 Old Agatagaville Road in Prattville, Alabama. The skull had a small medallion with a pentacle glued to it. Little is known about who the skull belonged to, except that she was a black female with an estimated age of 40 to 60 years of age. She could have died between 1950 to 2007. No dental or fingerprints are available, but DNA is. Was the pentacle glued to the skull as part of occult practices, or was this just something that a person with a golf flare for decorating discarded? In some black magic practice, Keeping the remains, whether a victim or dug up from a cemetery, as a way to bind the soul for divination services or a messenger. In 2019, a Reddit poster related the following. In early 2006, grave robbing was happening not far from where the skull was found. Just a little tidbit, albeit unlikely related to these cases. Another cold case tied to the same area is the disappearance of Shannon Nicole Polk, 11, who was last seen in the Candlestick RV Park where she lived. Her mother, Maria Polk, left for work at 7 a.m. When she came home, her daughter had not been there, and by 7 p.m., the family became concerned. Residents of the RV Park began looking for her. Police contacted Shannon's father, Billy Joe Polk, who lived in Eufaula, to make sure she was not there. She wasn't. Federal, state, and local authorities conducted an intense search for her without any luck. In September 2001, a three-minute segment was aired on America's Most Wanted. They also aired a composite of the man the police were looking for as a witness. Someone had placed the man talking to Shannon the day she disappeared. He was described as a white man, about six feet tall, stocky, muscular build, very tanned, with a beer belly. He was estimated to be between 35 to 45 years old. His arms were hairy and his teeth yellow and crooked. He had pronounced creases around his eyes and mouth and across his brow. A bump on the bridge of his nose indicated it was once broken. He had, prominent, he had a prominent mole under his right eye with hairs growing out of it toward his nose. At that time, the man wore his dark hair short and he had a mustache and goatee. He was driving a white four-door car that was covered in red dirt. He may have been inside Candlestick Park before Shannon's abduction and had access to different vehicles. At the beginning of October 2001, the search ended. Rabbit hunters in a wooded area north of Prattville found the body which was later identified as Shannon Polk. According to Margaret Faulkner, an FBI agent assigned to the case, they were looking for a suspect who was familiar with the mobile home park where Shannon lived and the area where the body was found. A sergeant with the Prattville Police Department said that the subject may have changed his personal appearance by growing or removing facial hair or changing his hair color. He asked people in the area to look out for someone who recently cleaned his car more than would be normal. Despite all the effort by law enforcement and the community, the case went cold. In December 2006, 
the remains of Heaven Lachey Ross, 11, who had disappeared in 2003, two years to the month of Shannon's disappearance, were found in an abandoned house in Holt, Alabama, six miles east of Northport off Crescent Ridge Road. It was a place known where people used drugs and did other illegal activities. She was taken on a rainy morning while walking to her school bus stop near her home in Willowbrook, Willowbrook Trailer Park. An FBI forensics team scoured the site where her remains were found. Police have never revealed how they believe Heaven was killed. The police department tried to determine if Heaven's murder was connected to Shannon Polk's case and the disappearance of Teresa Melissa Dean of Twiggs County, Georgia, near Macon, who disappeared in 1999. All three girls disappeared in August. They were 11 years old. All three lived in trailer parks. In all three cases, commercial construction, road work, or bridge building was being done nearby. Teresa disappeared August 15, 1999. She was wearing a blue and white striped shirt, orange knit pants, clear gel sandals, and gold ball earrings. She had a speech impediment. She was last seen walking down Lawrence Street near her family trailer at about 8 p.m. She said she was going to a friend's house to see some puppies, but she never arrived. Cody Dwayne Landers, Teresa's mother's live-in boyfriend at that time, failed a polygraph test, which she took voluntarily shortly after Teresa disappeared. He said it had been improperly administered. The relationship between him and Teresa's mother ended. In October 2001, he was convicted on seven child molestation charges in Georgia involving two children and he was sent to prison. He, had, he has been released and is living in a southern state and is registered in a national database as an adult tier 3 sex offender. Teresa's body has never been found and authorities believe she was a victim of foul play. Teresa's 14-year-old sister Christy was put into foster care after her disappearance. There must have been some type of risk at the home for her to be removed from her mother's care. A Reddit poster commented, And the fact that someone else called the police because they thought the family wasn't searching properly is heartbreaking, a throwaway child. All of these cases remain unsolved, and in some instances the victims are unnamed. And as you can see, you know, the first two, obviously, even though they were, the, the, the skeletal remains, they were, uh, found in the in 2007 it's very difficult to determine just how long they have been dead because of what little remains so hopefully unless they get a DNA match which hopefully that will come about at some point in the future and these little girls same thing um, cases remain unsolved and Teresa even though her body has she's considered missing in other words um, because her body has never been discovered. So, until they find her remains, you know, she's just considered, uh, but they do suspect that something happened to her. And it, it's a shame. And at the bottom of the article, if you want to go to Erie News, I do have links for more information about these cases. And if you have any information and you want to contact uh, law enforcement, go there. Let's go on to the next story. This is out of the New York Post, and it's titled, Jaws Child Star Named Police Chief of Town, Where Movie Was Filmed. I think this is great. Okay, uh, from co-starring in Jaws to enforcing the laws. Jonathan Searle has been named the new police chief of Oak Buffs, 47 years after he filmed Steven Spielberg's iconic shark, Shocker, in the same Massachusetts town that went by the fictional name of Amity in the classic summer blockbuster. His appointment generated a big bite of buzz when the tiny town's board announced it had voted 3-1 to one to offer the top cop role to the longtime community servant. I'm finding the whole thing quite funny myself, Cyril, 56, told the newspaper on Thursday amid all the fuss on the island located south of Cape Cod. Oak Bluffs, which is home to just over 5,000 full-time residents, is part of ritzy Martha's Vineyard, where Jaws was shot back in 1975. In that movie, Cyril and his real-life brother, Stephen, memorably played two pranksters who caused mass panic on the beach after swimming into the ocean with a cardboard fin. Cyril is actually a real-life native of Martha's Vineyard and chose not to pursue a movie career despite his role in one of the most famous films of all time. Instead, the former child actor 
and son of Police Chief George Cyril, who served on the force for 30 years and held the top cop role from 1981 to 1995, joined the PD in, early, in nearby Egertown back in 1986. I'm clearly elated and I am humbled and honored to have been offered a position, he told the local news outlet, the Vineyard Gazette. It's something I've been working towards my whole career. As he gradually rose through the ranks, the younger Cyril almost recently helped lead Project Outreach, an initiative partnering officers with recovery coaches to help get residents battling addiction into treatment programs. Ironically, Jaws revolved around the exploits of a police chief named Martin Brody. The flick, which grossed a whopping $472 million at the worldwide box office, saw the fictional Brody, played by Ray Schneider, Roy Schneider, join forces with marine biologist Matt Hooper, Richard Dreyfus to hunt down a man-eating great white shark. However, Cyril hopes life won't imitate art, saying he wants to focus on catching criminals on dry land, not deadly sea life skulking in nearby waters. But back in 2008, News of terrifying shark sightings hit headlines in Martha's Vineyard, with Cyril forced to investigate. A man sparked panic after telling beachgoers he had noticed two huge great white sharks swimming in the waters off Martha's Vineyard. But Cyril's investigation determined that there were no such sharks with a man named as Michael Lopenzo, determined to be a, oh, determined to be a hoaxer who was later charged with disorderly conduct. At the time, Jaws supervans noticed the irony of the fact that Cyril had tracked down a shark hoaxer after playing one himself in one of the most famous films of all times. What's that saying? Truth is stranger than fiction. Well, life is like that sometimes, too. Okay, this other story is out of the New York Times, and it's titled, She Wrote, How to Murder Your Husband. Did she do it? Prosecutors are building a follow-the-string murder case against a romance novelist. She says their real story is one about love. This is out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, while pondering the best methods for spousal murder, the romance novelist Nancy Brophy wrote that her career as an author with steamy stories of romance and betrayal left her thinking often about killings and how the police investigate them. A spouse who commits mar mar mariticide will almost certainly become a prime suspect, she said in a 2011 blog po post titled How to Murder Your Husband. The wife, she said, must be organized, ruthless, and very clever. After all, if the murder is supposed to set me free, I certainly don't want to spend any time in jail, Miss Brophy wrote. And let me say clearly for the record, I don't like jumpsuits and orange isn't my color. Seven years later, Miss Brophy's husband, Daniel, was brutally murdered shot twice inside the kitchen of a Portland, Oregon Culinary Institute where he was arriving for work on a sunny June morning. Now prosecutors are trying to build a follow-the-string criminal case to prove that Miss Brophy, 71, killed her husband with the same type of brutal cunning she once speculated would be necessary to evade conviction and reap the rewards, compiling gun components to avoid leaving a trace attacking when no cameras or witnesses were present, and moving to collect on a series of life insurance policies within days of her husband's death. This week, Ms. Brophy took the stand in her own defense in Multon Multnomah County Circuit Court, at times sobbing as she described the horror of losing her husband and laughing as she told stories of a happy quarter-century relationship with plans to retire soon and travel the world. Ms. Brophy praised her husband as smart, funny, kind, and humble, saying the two never had serious conflict or doubted their commitment to each other, a tragic love story without the betrayal. His weaknesses were my strength. My strengths tended to be his weaknesses, she told the jury. Together, it just fit immediately and never stopped. The Brophys had met in the early 1990s after Miss Brophy, then Nancy Crampton, moved to Portland and took classes at a culinary school where Mr. Brophy was her instructor. The two eventually started dating and got married, building a quiet life in the Portland suburbs where Mr. Brophy tended to chickens and grew spices on a back lot of land, and Miss Brophy dabbled in jobs ranging from life insurance sales to romance writing. Miss Brophy never had much financial success in her writing, mostly pursuing self-published novels with covers featuring shirtless men and titles such as The Wrong Husband and The Wrong Cop. She would spend her mornings writing in bed, her husband often bringing her coffee from Starbucks. 
My stories are about pretty men and strong women, about families that don't always work, and about the joy of finding love and the difficulty of making it stay. Miss Brophy wrote in an author bio, where she lavished praise on her husband and the life they had built together. The couple had no children together, but defense lawyers called some relatives and friends who praised the Brophy's marriage. Miss Brophy's niece, Susan Estrada, had come to live with a couple for a year about a decade ago, learning to sell insurance alongside Miss Brophy. She said the couple had a collaborative relationship with Miss Brophy stopping her riding to help her husband around the house and him making meals and packing lunches when she was on the road for insurance sales. It was a kind of relationship that made me personally think marriage may not be a bad idea, Miss Estrada testified. On the morning of June 2, 2018, students arriving at the Oregon Culinary Institute discovered Mr. Brophy's body on the floor of a back kitchen where he had been at a sink filling buckets of water and ice not long after arriving and unlocking the building. Later that morning, after being told there was police activity at the Institute, Miss Brophy arrived on scene. Detectives shared the news that her husband had been killed. Miss Brophy told them that her husband had arisen around 4 a.m. to feed the chickens and walk the dogs, and that she awoke when he came upstairs to have a shower. They discussed a leak in the sink, Miss Brophy said, and she estimated that he left for work a little after 7 a.m. At that point, what we consider Miss Crampton Brophy was a grieving spouse that had just learned her husband had been brutally murdered by a handgun. Detective Anthony Merrill of the Portland Police Bureau testified, we felt, we felt sad for her. Officers took Miss Brophy home, where she directed them to a gun in a closet. She said she had bought the weapon after the school shooting in Parkland, Florida, left her feeling unsafe. All the way in Florida? And she's in Oregon? Mm -hmm. Other detectives were scouring the scene of the shooting for surveillance video. There were no cameras there, but a nearby pizza restaurant had footage showing a small snapshot of the street outside. Investigators skimmed through the video looking for anything noteworthy from earlier in the day. They soon came to a jarring image, one that caused them to rewind the recording to take another look. Early that morning, an old Toyota minivan that looked like Miss Brophy's had driven by the Culinary Institute. That minivan, detectives soon found, appeared in other videos from around the neighborhood. Prosecutors say it was clearly Miss Brophy driving the van. It arrived in the area at 6.39 a.m., at a time when Miss Brophy had said she was still in bed. At one point, footage showed the van was parked on a hillside with a view of the Culinary Institute. Other cameras showed the van next to the Culinary Institute. Other cameras showed the van next to the Culinary Institute at about 7.08 a.m., then again about 20 minutes later. The window of time in which investigators believed that Mr. Brophy was killed. Miss Brophy testified this week that she had no recollection of being there during the early morning, nor of much that happened later, as she was processing the shock of learning that her husband was dead. She testified that she might have been making a usual run to Starbucks while jotting notes about her latest story on a notepad when her van showed up on the surveillance footage, but that she could not be sure. Investigators found more. In their conversation about the gun in her closet, Miss Brophy had not disclosed that she had also bought a ghost gun kit a collection of pieces to make an unregistered firearm. And on eBay, they learned she had bought a side, a slide and barrel assembly that could be used to modify the gun she had turned over to investigators. That assembly was never recovered. Prosecutors contend that Miss Brophy could have attached the slide and barrel to her gun to commit the murder before swapping it out so investigators would be unable to link the unique markings on the bullets to the gun in her possession. Miss Brophy testified that she bought the ghost gun kit and slide and barrel assembly for the research of a new book, The Tale of a Woman and an Abusive Relationship Who Turned the Tables on Her Lover by Gradually Acquiring Gun Parts Each Month to Slowly Build a Complete Weapon. Bank records show that the payments for the parts came from the couple's joint account, and Miss Brophy said her husband was well aware of the purchases opening the gun kit with her after it arrived in the mail. But in a dramatic scene during testimony, on Tuesday, Miss Brophy conceded that she had at one point removed the slide and barrel of the gun she had bought after Parkland, a weapon she testified was meant for protection, not research. A deputy district attorney, Sean Overstreet, pounced bringing the gun toward the witness stand. Why, he asked, would she need to buy another slide and barrel for research when she already had one in her home to examine? Miss Brophy said she was fascinated with gun parts and how her book character might acquire them. It was for writing, she said. It was not, too, as you have as you would have it, murder my husband. The defense claims that the surveillance footage provides hints about other potential suspects. 
The video shows homeless people walking around the neighborhood. The defense lawyers noted, in, noted including footage of one man who hid behind a wall and looked in a bag when police officers arrived on the morning of the killing. Investigators said they had not been able to identify the man. They noted that Mr. Brophy's wallet, cell phone, and car keys were untouched. Prosecutors argue that Ms. Brophy had a financial incentive to kill her husband. The couple had been going through a period of financial instability, taking a loan from Mr. Brophy's 401k account, yet they were spending hundreds of dollars each month on life insurance premiums. Ms. Brophy's lawyers countered that she had bought policies because of her work as an insurance agent and that she was not the beneficiary on all of them. In the wake of her husband's death, prosecutors said Ms. Brophy moved to collect on policies worth $1.4 million. Four days after the killing, Ms. Brophy spoke to one of the investigators, asking whether he would provide a letter saying she was not a suspect, according to audio of the conversation. The detective who appeared taken aback asked why, and Ms. Brophy disclosed that her insurance company was making her provide verification for a $40,000 life insurance claim. They don't want to pay it if it turns out that I secretly went down into the school and shot my husband because I thought, hey, going into old age without Dan after 25 years is really what I'm looking for, Miss Brophy said in the recording. She was charged with his murder three months later. So did she do it? Hmm. Wow. That's a good whodunit. I wonder how that's going to turn out. Interesting. Okay. Next one is out of Mental Floss, and this is titled Madeline Astor, the Gilded Beginnings and Harrowing Survival of the Titanic's Most Famous Widow. Let's see. In 1911, a teenage socialite named Madeline Talmadge Force rose from relative obscurity to land one of the greatest eligible bachelors of her era, a newly divorced Colonel John Jacob Astor IV, who was widely, widely regarded as one of the richest men in the world. But within less than a year, she'd go down in history for something far more tragic. Alongside her husband, she was a passenger on the ill-fated RMS Titanic when it struck an iceberg on April 14, 1912. Madeline, who was 18 years old and five months pregnant with her first child, was helped into lifeboat number four by her husband, who then asked if he could join her on account of her delicate condition. No, sir, no man is allowed on this boat or any of the boats until the ladies are off. Second officer Charles Lightoller reportedly replied, according to fellow passenger Archibald Gracie IV, who gave sworn testimony of the exchange to the U.S. Senate and later April 1912 as part of their inquiry into the disaster. With that simple degree, Madeline's life would be altered forever. But her story, like those other Titanic survivors, Molly Brown and Ava Hart, didn't end once the liner sank to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Born in Brooklyn in June 1893, Madeline grew up in the glow of the Gilded Age, a period of the late 19th century known for rapid economic expansion and opulence. New York was in many ways the epicenter of this. By the early 1880s, Carolyn Lena Astor, the mother of Colonel John Jacob Astor IV, led high society circles as the premier member of the 400, a group of the city's most influential and affluent elites. A champion of old money, meaning wealth that was generational and inherited, not recently acquired, and tradition, Lena Astor, or the Mrs. Astor, as she would come to be known, positioned herself as the authority on all matters, aristocratic, within the city, commanding immense social power and control until her death in 1908, which made the front page of the New York Times. Madeline's family wasn't the new money sort that Mrs. Astor reviled, but they didn't belong to the 400 either. Her mother, Catherine Talmadge Force, was the granddaughter of Thomas Talmadge, a former Brooklyn mayor. Her father, William Hurlbut Force, owned a shipping company and was a member of the New York Chamber of Commerce. As the younger of two daughters, Madeline benefited from many of the comforts the family's wealth afforded. She attended two prestigious schools for women, Miss Eli's in Greenwich, Connecticut, and the Manhattan-based Miss Spence's, from which she graduated in spring 1910. Along with her mother and older sister Catherine, she traveled abroad often during her childhood, including an extended stay in Paris. Emma Bullitt, a Paris correspondent for the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, who met Madeline during one of her family sojourns, would describe her in 1911 as a sweet girl who loved animals, spoke and wrote French fairly well, and knew how to twine herself around the heart of anybody.
old or young. But her future stunning successes seemed unlikely. It would have defied any prophetess that some day she would be the most talked of American girl in America, Bullitt wrote, adding that there was absolutely nothing at that time to make her look as if destined to be singled out in any way. The forces were not counted among the 400, according to an official list curated by society leader Ward McAllister with the help of Mrs. Astor, and later published by the New York Times in February of 1892. Nevertheless, the family embraced many of the upper stratus customs, including spending their summers in Bar Harbor, Maine. It was in Bar Harbor, toward the end of the summer season in 1910, that Madeline reportedly met her future husband, Colonel John Jacob Astor IV, a title he was granted based on a ceremonial appointment to the military staff of New York Governor Levi P. Morton in 1894, was 46, had a net worth of around $87 million, valued at approximately $2.4 billion today, and was newly single. His first wife, Ava Willing Astor, had been granted divorce in March of that same year on the grounds of infidelity. The terms of the divorce were particularly stringent. Colonel Astor was forbidden to remarry within the state of New York for the remainder of his ex-wife's lifetime unless permission was given by the court after five years had passed. She reportedly received a lump sum settlement of $10 million worth about $281 million today. Other reports claim she was awarded closer to $60,000 per year, equivalent to roughly $1.6 million annually in modern times. Their son Vincent, 18, and slated to attend Harvard University, opted to stay with his father. Their daughter, Ava Alice Muriel, known as Muriel, was seven and lived with her mother. Even after their split, Ava Willie Astor remained a fixture in high society. Following the death of the Mrs. Astor in 1908, there was talk that she might assume her mother-in-law's vacated role as a society leader. This never panned out, however, perhaps due to the divorce or because she moved to London in 1911. By August of 1910, Ava Willing Astor's position was such that when she had expectedly arrived in Newport, Rhode Island with Muriel, it caused a stir, especially for ex-husband, who was already there and hadn't expected to see her. Eager to avoid her, Colonel Astor slipped aboard his yacht, Noma, with his son and set sail for Bar Harbor. Shortly after arriving, he saw Madeline playing tennis with her sister and was impressed. Later that day, the pair played a mixed double match against Vincent and Catherine. And ever since then, the New York American Report 1911, the Colonel's devotion to the 18-year-old beauty had been constant and intense. The rumor mill didn't swirl around Madeline and Colonel Astor right away. In the meantime, she took center stage in more ways than one, making her formal society debut on December 22, 1910. Regarded as one of the handsomest of the debutantes for that reason, for that season, Madeline was quickly embraced by the Junior League, a clique of young, well-to-do women poised to take New York High Society by storm, and appeared on stage as part of a pantomime held for charity at the Plaza Hotel in February 1911, along with other up-and-comers belonging to the League. Colonel Astor was never too far removed from these events. Throughout the winter months, Madeline appeared as his guest of honor at several dinners he hosted at the St. Regis Hotel, and she was often noticed in the Astor box within the Golden Horseshoe at the Metropolitan Opera House with her mother as chaperon. Her presence there signified two things. It suggested the pair had a close relationship, and it enhanced her social standing. It was from this box that the Mrs. Astor would frequently make or break the status of other would-be social climbers with a mere nod of recognition. By spring 1911, the 400 had taken notice. New York is interested, read one April headline, in Miss Force, a young woman well-known in New York society. Another headline in May proclaimed, Pretty girl may marry rich Mr. Astor. And soon, many more like it appeared. After months of speculation, Madeline's father put it all to rest on August 1, 1911. From the steps of his office at 78 Front Street in New York City, he announced to the press that the pair were engaged, but no official date had been set yet for the wedding. News of the Astor engagement kicked up tremendous controversy, both within society circles and around other parts of the country, even sparking protest. Religious leaders around the U.S. and across many denominations, including the Roman Catholic Church, condemned the match. In remarrying Colonel Astor, an Episcopalian, 
was not technically in violation of the laws of his church, but many still cited his recent divorce as a reason not to perform the ceremony. Others denounced the impending nuptials on account of Colonel Astor's character and Madeline's age, attributing this to wicked lust and considering it a mere conquest of beauty. For Madeline, the uproar over a forthcoming wedding struck closer to home. She received threatening letters from other young women and soon fell ill, the severe nervous and physical strain of it taking an extreme toll. While Astor received the bulk of the bad press, the 400 focused their disapproval on Madeline, giving her the cold shoulder at events and refusing to acknowledge her as the heir apparent to the Mrs. Astor. By the end of August, she had recovered from her illness and more news about her $30,000 engagement ring, roughly $843,000 today, and reported $5 million marriage settlement, worth about $141 million today, began to trickle in through the press. Some friends of the pair maintained it wasn't wealth, lust, or societal ambition that brought them together. It was love, and that any talk about this being anything but a love match is ridiculous. On September 10, 1911, they married at Beechwood, Astor's sprawling Oceanside estate in Newport, Rhode Island. The search for someone to marry them had not been easy. Several clergymen claimed they were offered money to do it, with one Presbyterian pastor asserting he had been offered as much as $20,000. At one point, a carpenter, who had once been a Baptist pastor, agreed to do it. But according to the New York Times, Madeline was assistant that a clergyman in good standing in a parish be the one to perform the ceremony so the carpenter was nixed. Ultimately, it was Reverend Joseph Lambert, a congregation, a congregation, congre, can't say this, pastor from Providence, Rhode Island, who sealed the deal. Congregate, congre, I, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce it. On the subject of money, Lambert said nothing, claiming it was nobody's business, but he was rumored to receive two thousand dollars. Facing backlash from religious groups in Chicago, Rhode Island, and other parts of the country, he left the church in November, reportedly to go into business. <laughs> yeah. Once married, the Astros embarked on an extended honeymoon, visiting Rhinecliff on the Hudson, New York, and later Bermuda. By November, news broke they had planned to go to Egypt, eventually making their way to the Nile in January of 1912. While there, they toured the region with Margaret, Molly Brown, a new money debutante and future fellow Titanic passenger who was no stranger to controversy she was recently estranged from her husband. Like Brown, the Astors went to Europe after touring Egypt. They boarded the RMS Titanic at Cherbourg, France on April 10th with a small party that included Kitty, their beloved Airedale Terrier, and a private nurse for Madeline, who by then was visibly, visibly pregnant and required constant care as the pair moved from place to place. Aside from taking walks on the Titanic's deck with Astor and Kitty, Madeline mostly stayed in their first-class cabins, C-62 and 64, which were considered the finest on the liner, perhaps for her health or possibly to avoid whispers about her marriage. The couple had retired to their rooms for the evening when the great ship struck an iceberg at 11.40 p.m. on April 14, 1912. Colonel Astor reportedly stirred first and woke Madeline up, then told her to get dressed as he left to find Captain Edward Smith. When he returned to their quarters, his face looked graver than it had been, and he told her the liner had hit an iceberg, but assured her there was no danger. Throughout all the commotion, Madeline later maintained her husband seemed like the calmest man on the Titanic's deck. His almost preternatural repose in the face of mortal danger could be attributed to a number of things. Namely, he might have genuinely believed the so-called unsinkable liner wouldn't sink, and was overheard on the boat deck, to have said, we are safer here than in that little lifeboat. But also, he faced trouble at sea before. His yacht, the Normahal, famously went missing in Jamaica for about two weeks in November of 1909, following a bad storm. He survived unscathed, which may have informed some of his mindset aboard the Titanic on that faithful night. By 1.30 a.m. on April 15, the Astros were still aboard the Titanic, having passed much of the time in between by playing with mechanical horses in the gymnasium. But as other passengers increasingly scrambled to find lifeboats, panic may have set in for them too. Although Colonel Astor maintained that the ship would be fine, he insisted that Madeline change into warmer clothes and helped her to do so right on the deck after his valet returned to the rooms and retrieved them. Madeline in turn later saw third-class passenger Leah Axe with her infant son and gave the woman a scarf to wrap around the baby so he could stay warm. 
Second Officer Light Toller arrived on a deck at around 1.45 a.m. to finish loading lifeboat number four, and by that point, any notions Colonel Astor had of the ship's survival had likely vanished. Archibald Gracie IV, another passenger, observed him help Madeline through one of the steamer's enclosed promenade windows into the lifeboat as it was being lowered. He also heard Colonel Astor ask to join in order to protect his wife. When his request was denied, he demanded a lifeboat's number so he could track her down afterward and then stopped there from lowering any further so that the two could, two other first-class passengers, Ida Hippock and her teenage daughter Jean, could take the final spaces remaining on it. The sea is calm and you will be all right, Astor cried to his wife as lifeboat number four slipped out of the davits to the sea. You are in good hands and I will meet you in the morning. It was the last time Madeline saw him alive. Lifeboat number four hit the water with a thud at around 1.55 a.m., but right before it did, a man, in a state of great excitement, leapt off the deck of the Titanic and landed in it, alongside Madeline and the other women. She grabbed an oar, as did several women aboard, and they began to row frantically away from the ship. But the force of the sinking liner, which went under at around 2.20 a.m., almost sucked them down with it. As icy sea water sloshed into the lifeboat, Madeline and the others, except for the man reportedly groveled and hid under blankets, tried, desperately tried to bail it out. They were successful, and once the whirlpool had settled, they returned to the area to search for survivors and managed to pull six men out from the water, although one was dead and the other died shortly thereafter. Throughout, Madeline was said to have displayed the greatest courage and fortitude. Neither Colonel Astor, his valet, nor his cherished Airedale Terrier, Kitty, Kitty, survived the disaster, but Madeline did, along with her maid and nurse. She was reported to be dazed by shock and suffering from a nervous collapse when she arrived back in New York and was immediately put on bed rest. Her physicians gave strict orders that she not discuss the sinking any further as her nerves remained badly shattered and in her waking hour she spends much of her time weeping with the recollection of the horror she underwent. Colonel Astor's body was found by the McKay Bennett, a cable ship hired by the White Star Liner on April 22nd and by April 26th his son Vincent and Astor estate trustee Nicholas Biddle headed to Halifax, Nova Scotia to retrieve it. His initials have been sewn into his jacket, which helped to identify him. Among his personal effects, he was found with a gold pocket watch that also bore his initials, and which Vincent kept and wore for the rest of his life. Postmortem, Colonel Astor was branded a hero for helping save three women and his unborn child. Madeline's fortitude revealed itself in other ways, too. Despite the tremendous stress of the titanic ordeal, she successfully carried her pregnancy to term, giving birth to the couple's son, John Jacob Astor VI, later dubbed the Titanic Baby in the press, on August 14th. By this time, the detail of Colonel Astor's will had been widely publicized. He left the bulk of his fortune to Vincent, but gave Madeline $100,000 outright worth about $2.75 million today, as well as a full use of his home on Fifth Avenue, New York, and a trust fund of $5 million. For their son, he left behind a $3 million trust fund. Although the terms of his will were generous, it included a tricky clause. If Madeline ever remarried, she would lose the trust fund along with the Fifth Avenue house. For a young widow with a child, a lifelong stricture of this magnitude struck some contemporaries as unfair. Yet for Madeline, who always maintained that she married for love and not money, it was love in the end that ultimately held the most sway. In 1916, after years of relative seclusion from society, events in the press, she married again, this time to a childhood friend, William Carl Dick, in a simple ceremony at the sun, as the sun shone brightly overhead. While she lost the house, trust fund, and the famous last name that for so many years had commanded such awe and dread, in New York high society circles, she gained a new family, and the notoriety of being the most famous and one of the most tragic widows of the great disaster stayed with her until the end of her days. There you go. It not always about money. This other story is out of the UFO trail. And it's titled Pulp UFO Writers and the FBI. You know, since now, after 50 years, the Senate is having meetings about UFOs. Well, here we go. Ray Palmer was an editor and distributor of pulp magazines during the mid-20th century. 
he got this is this is first person written by the author he got in my sights while i was researching and writing wayward sons nightcap and the ic palmer distributed pulp fantasy and sci-fi on a wide scale and is considered to have significantly contributed to the public perception of flying saucers and conspiracies during his era suffice it to say palmer was not overly concerned with accuracy in his magazines as compared to getting eyes on the pages major donald kehoe who became the face of the national investigation committee on aerial phenomena was a widely published author before his run as the most high pro- high profile ufo activist of his time his writing included contrib- contrib- contributions to the fantasy genre as Palmer was popularizing, Kehoe's work once made the cover of Weird Tales. FBI records on Kehoe indicate the Bureau was not a fan of his articles. In 1958, FBI memo on Kehoe quotes Bureau Assistant Director Nichols as describing Kehoe's writing as flamboyant and irresponsible. An example is cited of a 1941 piece co authored by Kehoe and published in Cosmopolitan. It apparently reported Adolf Hitler had a plan to seize the merchant marines and went on to assert the FBI possessed documents to that effect. The memo stated the assertion was completely false. From the 1958 FBI memo, there was no doubt media was a valuable tool in shaping public sentiment and the FBI had keen interest in all phases of the process. That included Palmer and his distribution of pulp magazines in addition to keeping an eye on what was coming out of the typewriter of Donald Kehoe. A 1953 report contained in an FBI file obtained on Ray Palmer lists five publications he operated at that point in time. Among them was Fate, with a reported circulation of 65,000. Several former publications were mentioned in the report as well, such as Amazing Stories, which gave rise to some of Palmer's most widely known sensations. The FBI file indicates an investigation was launched on Palmer in 1953 after the Bureau received a tip he was publishing communist propaganda. Palmer would have seemingly been in a minority if he wasn't accused of communist sympathizing and the investigation found nothing of concern, at least not about Russians. There were other aspects of the resulting reports authored by special agents that caught the attention though. Not unlike the actions of Kehoe, writers and opportunists numbered among those who worked the FBI into their narratives. One was Paul Vest, published in Palmer's Mystic Magazine. This was the kind of thing that tended to get Director Hoover's attention. And in 1954, agents were dispatched to Palmer's location in Evanston, Illinois. They were equipped with instructions from Hoover to make it clear the FBI did not appreciate having the name of the Bureau used in fantastic stories appearing in his publication to add credence to stories and articles. The vest piece was titled, catchily enough, Venusians Walk Our Streets. The author claimed in the story that FBI labs were in possession of a steel plate that just such a Venusian had marked with a half-inch deep streak with no more efforts than passing his fingernail over it. This also obviously suggested the Bureau was aware of said Venusians walking among the population. How Hoover subsequently investigated to satisfaction there were no FBI personnel at any such labs, spreading stories as is published and subsequently sent agents to make Palmer well aware of the fact. In a memo dated July 22, 1954, a special agent in charge at the Milwaukee field office advised Hoover contact was made with Ray Palmer. Palmer reportedly apologized for the misrepresentation of the Bureau and described it as an oversight on his part. This is where it gets a bit more interesting. Palmer offered to publish a retraction, according to the FBI report refuting Vest's claim about the FBI. Palmer further informed the agent he regularly supplied the CIA in Chicago with saucer reports mailed to him that he thought were more most feasible and he was advised the agency was interested in flying saucer reports. The FBI agent wrote Palmer explained that in the next issue of Mystic Magazine, he would be glad to insert an article agreeable to the Bureau. <laughs> Was this Ray Palmer's attempting to secure an, adv- an advantageous relationship with the FBI? It could also be interpreted as suggesting he already had such an arrangement with the CIA, and that perhaps the Bureau would find it mutually beneficial to be in the loop. Whatever might be read between the lines... It was indicative of the niche Palmer carved out for himself and a certain amount of power wielded. 
It also signaled the beginnings of a tumultuous and unsteady alliance between certain writers and their intelligence agency contacts on the topics of UFOs. Those precarious relationships would persist to this very day. <laughs> I have to laugh when I, you know, when I read this because you think of all these magazines, these pulp fiction magazines that held these way out. I mean, I mean, I know they were sci-fi, but some of these things were way out there. And to think that the FBI was looking at these and like scrutinizing them, <laughs> it's incredible. And then where he's telling them that. He's, he's supplying the CIA Chicago with saucer reports mailed to him. And when he says saucer reports, I don't know if these were stories, fiction stories people were making up. Or were these people sending him stories of sightings they had had of UFOs. But whichever way, he's forwarding them to the CIA. Why? Unless, of course, they were people were sending him reports of real sightings. And even then, I'm telling you. This is, again, anybody that's read any of these stories, and which I've read lots of them, um, in these magazines, they were, I mean, you read them and they're fantastical, which is great because they're fantasy, sci-fi, and things like that. But let's you know, Big Brother was always been watching. <laughs> All right. Um, this is out of the site YouGov America. And it's titled, Most Americans Say They Would Not Want to Bring Dinosaurs Back from Extinction. A new YouGov survey asked Americans for their thoughts on preserving endangered species or even trying to bring back extinct species. The findings suggest that while there are some creatures that Americans would like to bring back, there are many they'd prefer to leave in the past. Nearly three quarters, 74% of U.S. adult citizens strongly or somewhat support scientists trying to prevent animal species from going extinct. Far fewer, 11%, are strongly or somewhat opposed, and 15% say they are unsure. But bringing back extinct animals is a different story. Only one-third, 32% of Americans say they would strongly or somewhat support scientists trying to do this. Far more, 45%, say they are somewhat or strongly opposed to this idea. Men, 37%, are more likely than women, 27%, to say they would support scientists trying to bring back extinct species using genetic science. In other words, women like everything. They're, we're more careful. <laughs> we're thinking, yeah, you know, flashbacks of Jurassic Park going through your mind. 50% of Americans say that if it were possible to bring back extinct species, the giant tortoise would be reintroduced in their original habitat. While there are still some giant tortoises in the Galapagos Islands, several species have gone extinct. Slightly fewer Americans would want to reintroduce the passenger pigeon or the northern white rhinoceros. The people who want a return of northern white rhinos might get their wish. Scientists at the San Diego Zoo are reportedly working to bring the northern white rhinoceros back from extinction using frozen skin cells. Around 2 in 5, or 39%, would bring back the dodo bird, and 37% would introduce the Caribbean monk seal. When it comes to certain very large extinct creatures, most Americans agree with Dr. Ian Malcolm, played by Jeff Goldblum in the film Jurassic Park. Dinosaurs had their shot and nature selected them for extinction. Just one in 10 Americans, 10%, would bring back the Tyrannosaurus rex, while 11% would bring back the pterodactyl, and 12% would reintroduce the triceratops. About 7 in 10 Americans would not want these dinosaurs brought back and released in their original habitats. Men are more likely than women to think it's a good idea to bring back all of these extinct species. The gap is especially large on the question of the woolly mammoth, which 29% of men, but just 19% of women, say should be brought back. Men are also a percentage points more likely than women to say the Tasmanian tiger should be brought back. Men are about twice as likely to as women to want to try to bring back the Tyrannosaurus rex, the pterodactyl, and the triceratops. But by the way, even though the men, it's very low. 13% 13, 13 for men, 14 for the pterodactyl, and 16 for the triceratops. In other words, even for the guys that are saying, yeah, 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 it's like not really that many of them. Additional data from this survey finds that nearly half, or 48% of Americans, expect that humans themselves will also go extinct at some point. 
Relatively few think that humankind will go extinct in less than 100 years. Another 10% think it will happen in 101 to 500 years, and 10% think the end of humankind will happen in 501 to 1,000 years. About twice as many think it will take more than 1,000 years for humankind to go extinct. Eh. Older Americans are more likely to say humankind will never go the way of the dodo bird. I guess I fall into that category because I don't think that. But you know what they say here, older Americans, but I've never thought that. Even when I was younger, I never thought of us going extinct, ever. About one quarter, 26% of Americans 65 and older, along with 24% of 45 to 64-year-olds, say humans will never go extinct. Americans who are between 30 and 44 have less faith, and just 13% of adults under 30 share this opinion. (laughs) Okay, and by the way, the methodology used on this was they took a nationwide sampling of a thousand U.S. adult citizens, interviewed them online between April 13th to 19th of 2022, and the sample was weighed according to gender, age, race, and education, blah, based on the blah blah blah. That's a pretty good. That's a pretty good survey. That's a pretty good survey. A thousand. That's that's pretty decent. Interesting. Interesting. Let's go on to the next story, which is out of Phantoms and Monsters. And this is a titled River Troll, Humanoid Observed and Photographed in Coastal Mississippi. And Lon Strickland, as a matter of fact, uh, he's, he's, his, his blog is excellent. And this, uh, this was something, a story that was sent to him. A coastal Mississippi resident believed that they encountered a river troll while on their houseboat. They took a photo and described what they witnessed. This is the account that was forwarded to him. Quote, about six years ago, 2015, my family lived on our houseboat on the river in a small town in coastal Mississippi. We were on the deck one evening looking across the river. The tide was low and you could see well into the woods. Maybe 25 yards from us, something bent down near the water drinking. I went and retrieved my binoculars and took a closer look. It was pinkish tan with bulging eyes, funny looking ears two arms and two legs and what appeared to be horns coming out of its head. It had a short round body drinking from the shore. From what I saw, I would swear it was like a troll. It was devil ugly. I took my phone out and took a picture. To this day, anyone I show it to swears it's a river troll. Now, living on a houseboat, you see a lot of creepy stuff in the swamp. Also, there would always be trees or logs laying across the ditches or a 1,000 foot driveway in the middle of the swamp as if something put them there to cross the deep parts. You couldn't walk up or down without that eerie feeling of being watched. And it wasn't just me. Anyone who came out our way felt it. You could also hear what sounded like monkeys. One time, something threw a rock and hit my friend. I still own that property and the houseboats, but none of my grown kids will even go out there anymore. I don't show the picture to other people anymore. I don't have to prove anything, but I'm sharing it with you. I feel as if maybe I'm the lucky one to have been in contact with several creatures in this world and some twice. Yes, it's blurry and yeah, it's hard to make out, but you can clearly see its reflection in the water as it's drinking. And for you, those of you watching the the video portion of this, eh, okay, I would have to like kind of really look at it. It's unusual, yeah. That's an unusual looking thing there. Alrighty then. Okay. All right. Next to. I think this was really cute. This is out of Mental Floss and it's titled A Brief History of Library Cats. If you've ever browsed a library and noticed a feline friend wandering through the stacks of snoozing beneath a shelf, you've witnessed a tradition dating back thousands of years across the centuries. Cats have been members of library life at institutions around the world. They remain a part of many today, despite some heated campaigns for their removal. Domesticated cats were celebrated, esteemed creatures in ancient Egypt, but they also had important jobs. People introduced cats to libraries to prevent mice and other creatures from eating and damaging precious manuscripts. As the friendly felines spread throughout the world, they put their pest hunting prowess to work in various collections across the continents. The threat rodents posed to treasure tomes has kept library cats gainfully employed ever since. They've served some pretty high clientele. In the 18th century, Empress Elizabeth of Russia issued a decree 
ordering that the biggest, best mousers be brought into the royal palace, now the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, to catch rats that invaded the library. Their descendants continue to work there today. In most cases, people tend to adore their local library cats. Some of these felines gain a celebrity-like status that stretches beyond the communities they serve. There's even a map that shows some notable library cats that have worked across the United States. One of the most famous of them all was the Dewey Readmore Books, who lived in the public library of Spencer, Iowa. He was discovered there in 1988 at eight weeks old after being abandoned in the library's drop box and remained with the institution until his passing almost 20 years later. The cat was a much-loved member of the library. He was even given his own job description. Not everyone is thrilled to find a purring employee slinking around the stacks. One of the most frequent conflicts involves library users who suffer from allergies. The Colon Township Library in Michigan had to remove its cat Jasper after one family threatened to take legal action as a result of allergy issues. Fortunately, Jasper was able to be rehomed with the library's director. One of the most high-profile controversies in recent years concerned a cat named Browser at a library in Texas. Browser was originally brought in to deal with a mice problem, then became so popular with staff and patrons that he stayed on. But in 2016, the local council passed a motion demanding he be removed from the library due to allergy concerns. In response, a petition requesting he stay received over 12,000 signatures, and the town's mayor said he received a message from everywhere in the United States, as well as Germany, Australia, Malaysia, Guam, and England. Browser was eventually allowed to remain in the library after all. The international outcry about the prospect of browser's removal shows that library cats remain a beloved part of community thousands of years after they first patrolled the libraries of the ancient world. Despite the controversy they sometimes attract, they continue to have a valued place in the modern world, too. Great story. All right, folks, that is it. That is it for today, and I will be seeing you soon with another set of weird and unusual news. Until then.